Chapter One of Laughable Lyrics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Roloffs. Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. The Dong with a Luminous Nose. When awful darkness and silence reign over the great Grambulian plain, through the long, long wintry nights, when the angry breakers roar as they beat upon the rocky shore, when storm clouds brood on the towering heights of the hills of the Chankly Boar, then through the vast and gloomy dark there moves what seems a fiery spark a lonely spark with silvery rays piercing the coal-black night a meteor strange and bright hither and thither the vision strays a single lurid light slowly it wanders pauses creeps anon it sparkles flashes and leaps and ever as onward it gleaming goes, a light on the bong tree stems it throws. And those who watch at that midnight hour, from hall or terrace or lofty tower, cry as the wild light passes along, The dawn, the dawn, the wandering dawn through the forest goes, The dawn, the dawn, the dawn with the luminous nose. Long years ago the dong was happy and gay, till he fell in love with the jumbly girl who came from those shores one day. For the jumblies came in a sieve they did, landing at eve near the zemery fid, where the oblong oysters grow and the rocks are smooth and gray. And all the woods and the valleys rang with the chorus they daily and nightly sang, Far and few, far and few, are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. Happily, happily passed those days, while the cheerful jumblies stayed. They danced in circlets all night long to the plaintive pipe of the lively dong, in moonlight, shine, or shade. For day and night he was always there by the side of the jumbly girl so fair, with her sky-blue hands and her sea-green hair, till the morning came of that hateful day when the jumblies sailed in their sieve away, and the dong was left on the cruel shore, gazing, gazing forevermore ever keeping his weary eyes on that pea-green sail on the far horizon, singing the jumbly chorus still, as he sat all day on the grassy hill. Far and few, far and few, are the lands where the jumblies live. Their heads are green, and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. But when the sun was low in the west, the dong arose and said, What little sense I once possessed has quite gone out of my head. And since that day he wanders still by lake and forest, marsh and hill, singing, Oh, somewhere in the valley or plain, might I find my jumbly girl again. Forever I'll seek by lake and shore till I find my jumbly girl once more. Playing a pipe with silvery squeaks, since then his jumbly girl he seeks. And because by night he could not see, he gathered the bark of the twangum tree on the flowery plain that grows. And he wove him a wondrous nose, a nose as strange as a nose could be, of vast proportions and painted red, and tied with cords to the back of his head. In a hollow, rounded space it ended, 
with a luminous lamp within suspended, all fenced about with a bandage stout to prevent the wind from blowing it out, and with holes all around to send a light in gleaming rays on the dismal night, and now each night and all night long over those plains still roams the dong, and above the wail of the chimp and snipe you may hear the squeak of his plaintive pipe while ever he seeks but seeks in vain to meet with his jumbly girl again lonely and wild all night he goes the dong with the luminous nose and all who watch at the midnight hour from hall or terrace or lofty tower cry as they trace the meteor bright moving along through the dreary night this is the hour when forth he goes the dong with the luminous nose yonder over the plain he goes he goes he goes the dong with the luminous nose end of the dong with the luminous nose Chapter Two of Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs. The Two Old Bachelors. Two old bachelors were living in one house. One caught a muffin, the other caught a mouse. Said he who caught the muffin to him who caught the mouse. This happens just in time, for we've nothing in the house save a tiny slice of lemon and a teaspoonful of honey, and what to do for dinner since we haven't any money, and what can we expect if we haven't any dinner, but to lose our teeth and eyelashes and keep on growing thinner. Said he who caught the mouse to him who caught the muffin, We might cook this little mouse if only we had some stuffin'. If we had but sage and onion, we could do extremely well. But how to get the stuffin', it is difficult to tell. Those two old bachelors ran quickly to the town and asked for sage and onion as they wandered up and down. They borrowed two large onions, but no sage was to be found in the shops or in the market or in all the gardens round. But someone said, a hill there is, a little to the north, and to its purple-dicular top a narrow way leads forth, and there among the rugged rocks abides an ancient sage, an earnest man who reads all day a most perplexing page. Climb up, and seize him by the toes, all studious as he sits, and pull him down and chop him into endless little bits. Then mix him with your onion, cut it up likewise into scraps, when your stuffin' will be ready and very good, perhaps. These two old bachelors, without loss of time, the nearly purpledicular crags at once began to climb. And at the top, among the rocks, all seated in a nook, they saw that sage a reading of a most enormous book. You earnest sage, aloud they cried, your book you've read enough in. We wish to chop you into bits, to mix you into stuffin'. But that old sage looked calmly up, and with his awful book, at those two bachelors' bald heads a certain aim he took. And over crag and precipice they rolled promiscuous down. At once they rolled and never stopped in lane or field or town. And when they reached their house they found, besides their want of stuffin', the mouse had fled and previously had eaten up the muffin. They left their home in silence by the once convivial door, and from that hour those bachelors were never heard of more. End of the Two Old Bachelors
Chapter Three of Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs. The Pelican Chorus. King and Queen of the Pelicans, we no other birds so grand we see. None but we have feet like fins with lovely leathery throats and chins. Plofskin, Pluffskin, Pelican, G, we think no bird so happy as we. Plumpskin, Ploshkin, Pelican, Jill, we think so then and we thought so still. We live on the Nile, the Nile we love. By night we sleep on the cliffs above. By day we fish and at eve we stand on long bare islands of yellow sand. And when the sun sinks slowly down, and the great rock walls grow dark and brown, where the purple river rolls fast and dim, and the ivory ibis star-like skim, wing to wing we dance around, stamping our feet with a flumpy sound, opening our mouths as pelicans ought, and this is the song we nightly snort. Plofskin, Pluffskin, Pelican, G, we think no bird so happy as we. Plumpskin, Ploshkin, Pelican, Jill, we think so then and we thought so still. Last year came out our daughter Dell, and all the birds received her well. To do her honor a feast we made for every bird that can swim or wade. Herons and gulls and cormorants black, Cranes and flamingos with scarlet back, Plovers and snorks and geese in clouds, Swans and dilberry ducks in crowds, Thousands of birds in wondrous flight, They ate and drank and danced all night, And echoing back from the rocks you heard, Multitude echoes from bird and bird. Plofskin, Pluffskin, Pelican, G, we think no bird so happy as we. Plumpskin, Ploshkin, Pelican, Jill, we think so then and we thought so still. Yes, they came, and among the rest, the king of the cranes all grandly dressed. Such a lovely tail, its feathers float between the ends of his blue dress coat. With pea-green trousers all so neat, And a delicate frill to hide his feet, For though no one speaks of it, Everyone knows he has got no webs between his toes. As soon as he saw our daughter Dell, In violent love that Crane King fell, On seeing her waddling form so fair, With a wreath of shrimps in her short white hair, and before the end of the next long day, our Dell had given her heart away. For the king of the cranes had won that heart with a crocodile's egg and a large fish tart. She vowed to marry the king of cranes, leaving the Nile for stranger plains. And away they flew in a gathering crowd of endless birds in a lengthening cloud. Plofskin, Pluffskin, Pelican, G, we think no bird so happy as we. Plumpskin, Ploshkin, Pelican, Jill, we think so then and we thought so still. And far away in the twilight sky we heard them singing a lessening cry, farther and farther till out of sight, and we stood alone in the silent night. Often since, in the nights of June, we sit on the sand and watch the moon. She has gone to the great Grambulian plain, and we probably never shall meet again. Oft in the long still nights of June, we sit on the rocks and watch the moon. She dwells by the streams of the Chankly Boar, and we probably never shall see her more. Plofskin, Pluffskin, Pelican, G, we think no bird so happy as we. Plumpskin, Ploshkin, Pelican, Jill, we think so then and we thought so still. End of the Pelican Chorus
Chapter Four of Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs. The Courtship of the Yongi Bongi Bo. On the coast of Coromandel, where the early pumpkins blow, in the middle of the woods, live the Yongi Bongi Bo. Two old chairs and half a candle, one old jug without a handle, these were all his worldly goods. In the middle of the woods, these were all the worldly goods of the Yongi Bongi Bo, of the Yongi Bongi Bo. Once among the bong trees walking, where the early pumpkins blow, to a little heap of stones came the Yongi Bongi Bo. Then he heard a lady talking to some milk white hens of docking. Tis the lady Jingly Jones. On the little heap of stones sits the lady Jingly Jones, said the Yongi Bongi Bo, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Lady Jingly, Lady Jingly, sitting where the pumpkins blow, will you come and be my wife? Said the Yongi Bongi Bo. I'm tired of living singly on this coast so wild and shingly. I'm weary of my life. If you'll come and be my wife, quite serene will be my life. Said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Said the Yongi Bongi Bo. On this coast of Coromandel, shrimps and watercresses grow. Prawns are plentiful and cheap, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. You shall have my chairs and candle, and my jug without a handle. Gaze upon the rolling deep, fish is plentiful and cheap, as the sea, my love, is deep, said the Yongi Bongi Bo, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Lady Jingly answered sadly, and her tears began to flow. Your proposal comes too late, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. I would be your wife most gladly. Here she twirled her fingers madly. But in England I've a mate. Yes, you've asked me far too late. For in England I've a mate, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Mr. Jones, his name is Handel, Handel Jones, Esquire, and Co. Dorking Fowl's delights to send, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Keep, oh, keep your chairs and candle, and your jug without a handle. I can merely be your friend. Should my Jones more dockings send, I will give you three, my friend. Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Though you've such a tiny body, and your head so large doth grow, though your hat may blow away, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, though you're such a hotty dotty, yet I wish that I could muddy fi the words I needs must say. Will you please to go away? That is all I have to say. Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo, Mr. Yongi Bongi Bo. Down the slippery slopes of Myrtle, where the early pumpkins blow, to the calm and silent sea, fled the Yongi Bongi Bo. There beyond the Bay of Girdle lay a large and lively turtle. You're the cove, he said for me. On your back, beyond the sea, turtle, you shall carry me, said the Yongi Bongi Bo, said the Yongi Bongi Bo. Through the silent roaring ocean did the turtle swiftly go. Holding fast upon his shell rode the Yongi Bongi Bo. With a sad primeval motion towards the sunset isles of Boshan, still the turtle bore him well. Holding fast upon his shell, Lady Jingly Jones, farewell, 
sang the yongy bongy bo, sang the yongy bongy bo. End of the courtship of yongy bongy bo. Chapter Five of Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs. The Pobble Who Has No Toes. One. The Pobble Who Has No Toes had once as many as we. When they said, Someday you may lose them all, he replied, Fish fiddle dee dee. And his Aunt Jobiska made him drink lavender water tinged with pink, for she said, The world in general knows there's nothing so good for a pobble's toes. 2. The pobble who has no toes swam across the Bristol Channel, but before he set out he wrapped his nose in a piece of scarlet flannel. For his Aunt Jobiska said, No harm can come to his toes if his nose is warm. And it's perfectly known that a pobble's toes are safe, provided he minds his nose. 3. The pobble swam fast and well, and when boats or ships came near him, he tinkledy blinkledy winkled a bell, so that all the world could hear him. And all the sailors and admirals cried when they saw him nearing the further side, He has gone to fish for his Aunt Jobiska's runcible cat with crimson whiskers. 4. But before he touched the shore, the shore of the Bristol Channel, a sea-green porpoise carried away his wrapper of scarlet flannel. And when he came to observe his feet, formerly garnished with toes so neat, his face at once became forlorn on perceiving that all his toes were gone. 5. And nobody ever knew, from that dark day to the present, whoso had taken the pobble's toes in a manner so far from pleasant. Whether the shrimps or crawfish gray, or crafty mermaids stole them away, nobody knew, and nobody knows how the pobble was robbed of his twice five toes. 6. The pobble who has no toes was placed in a friendly bark, and they rowed him back and carried him up to his Aunt Jobiska's park. And she made him a feast at his earnest wish of eggs and buttercups fried with fish. And she said, It's a fact the whole world knows that pobbles are happier without their toes. The End of the Pobble Who Has No Toes Chapter 6 of Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs. The New Vestments. There lived an old man in the kingdom of Tess who invented a purely original dress. And when it was perfectly made and complete, he opened the door and walked into the street. By way of a hat, he'd a loaf of brown bread, in the middle of which he inserted his head. His shirt was made up of no end of dead mice, the warmth of whose skins was quite fluffy and nice. His drawers were of rabbit skins, so were his shoes. His stockings were skins, but it is not known whose. His waistcoat and trousers were made of pork chops. His buttons were jubjubes and chocolate drops. His coat was all pancakes with jam for a border, and a girdle of biscuits to keep it in order. And he wore over all, as a screen from bad weather, a cloak of green cabbage leaves stitched all together. 
he had walked a short way when he heard a great noise all sorts of beasticles birdlings and boys and from every long street and dark lane in the town beasts birdies and boys in a tumult rushed down two cows and a calf ate his cabbage leaf cloak four apes seized his girdle which vanished like smoke three kids ate up half of his pancakey coat and the tails were devoured by an ancient he-goat an army of dogs in a twinkling tore up his pork waistcoat and trousers to give to their puppies and while they were growling and mumbling the chops ten boys prigged the jubjubs and chocolate drops he tried to run back to his house but in vain four scores of fat pigs came again and again they rushed out of stables and hovels and doors they tore off his stockings his shoes and his drawers and now from the housetops with screechings descend striped spotted white black and gray cats without end they jumped on his shoulders and knocked off his hat when crows ducks and hens made a mincemeat of that they speedily flew at his sleeves in a trice and utterly tore up his shirt of dead mice they swallowed the last of his shirt with a squall whereon he ran home with no clothes on at all and he said to himself as he bolted the door i will not wear a similar dress any more any more any more any more never more end of the new vestments chapter seven of laughable lyrics by edward lear this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Gary Roloffs Mr. and Mrs. Discobolos Mr. and Mrs. Discobolos climbed to the top of a wall, and they sat to watch the sunset sky, and to hear the Nupiter Pifkin cry, and the Biscuit Buffalo call. They took up a roll and some chamomile tea, and both were as happy as happy could be, till Mrs. Discobolos said, o w x y z it has just come into my head suppose we should happen to fall darling mr discobolos suppose we should fall down flumpety just like pieces of stone on to the thorns or into the moat what would become of your new green coat and might you not break a bone it never occurred to me before that perhaps we shall never go down any more. And Mrs. Descobolo said, O W X Y Z, what put it into your head to climb up this wall, my own darling, Mr. Descobolos? Mr. Descobolos answered, At first it gave me a pain, and I felt my ears turn perfectly pink when your exclamation made me think we might never get down again but now i believe it is wiser far to remain forever just where we are and mr discobolo said o oh, w x y z it has just come into my head we shall never go down again dearest mrs discobolos so mr and mrs discobolos stood up and began to sing far away from hurry and strife here we will pass the rest of life ding a dong ding dong ding we want no knives nor forks nor chairs no tables nor carpets nor household cares from worry of life we fled o w x y z there is no more trouble ahead sorrow or any such thing for mr and mrs discobolos second part mr and mrs discobolos lived on top of the wall for twenty years a month and a day till their hair had grown all pearly gray and their teeth began to fall 
they never were ill nor at all dejected by all admired and by some respected till mrs discobolo said o w x y z it has just come into my head we have no more room at all darling mr discobolos look at our six fine boys and our six sweet girls so fair upon this wall they have all been born and not one of the twelve has happened to fall through my maternal care surely they should not pass their lives without any chance of husbands or wives and mrs discobolo said o w x y z did it never come into your head that our lives must be lived elsewhere dearest mr discobolos they have never been at a ball nor have even seen a bazaar nor have heard folks say in a tone all hearty what loves of girls at a garden party those mrs discobolos are morning and night it drives me wild to think of the fate of each darling child but mr discobolos said o w x y z what has come to your fiddly dumb head what a runcible goose you are octopod mrs discobolos suddenly mr discobolos slid from the top of the wall and beneath it he dug a dreadful trench and filled it with dynamite gunpowder gench and aloud he began to call let the wild bee sing and the bluebird hum for the end of your lives has certainly come and mrs discobolo said o w x y z we shall presently all be dead on this ancient runcible wall terrible mr discobolos pensively mr discobolos sat with his back to the wall he lighted a match and fired the train and the mortified mountain echoed again to the sound of an awful fall and all the discobolos family flew in thousands of bits to the sky so blue and no one was left to have said o w x y z has it come into anyone's head that the end has happened to all of the whole of the clan discobolos the end of mr and mrs discobolos laughable lyrics by edward lear this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary roloffs the quangle wangle's hat on the top of the crumpety tree the quangle wangle sat but his face you could not see on account of his beaver hat for his hat was a hundred and two feet wide with ribbons and bibbons on every side and bells and buttons and loops and lace so that nobody ever could see the face of the quangle wangle quee the quangle wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree jam and jelly and bread are the best food for me but the longer i live on this crumpety tree the plainer than ever it seems to me that very few people come this way and that life on the whole is far from gay said the quangle wangle quee but there came to the crumpety tree mr and mrs canary and they said did you ever see any spot so charmingly airy may we build a nest on your lovely hat mr quangle wangle grant us that oh please let us come and build a nest of whatever material suits you best mr quangle wangle quee and besides to the crumpety tree came the stork the duck and the owl the snail and the bumblebee the frog and the thimble fowl the thimble fowl with the corkscrew leg and all of them said we humbly beg we may build our homes on your lovely hat mr quangle wangle grant us that mr quangle wangle quee and the golden grouse came there and the pobble who has no toes 
and the small Olympian bear and the dong with the luminous nose, and the blue baboon who played the flute and the orient calf from the land of toot, and the attery squash with the brisky bat, all came and built on the lovely hat of the quangle wangle quee. And the quangle wangle said to himself on the crumpety tree, when all these creatures move, what a wonderful noise there'll be. And at night, by the light of the mulberry moon, they danced to the flute of the blue baboon on the broad green leaves of the crumpety tree, and all were as happy as happy could be with the quangle wangle quee. End of the quangle wangle's hat. Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs. The Cummerbund, an Indian poem. She sat upon her doby to watch the evening star, and all the punkas as they passed cried, My, how fair you are! Around her bower with quivering leaves, the tall Kamsamas grew, and Kitmagars in wild festoons hung down from Chokis blue. Below her home the river rolled with soft melubious sound, where gold-finned Chirprasis swam in myriads circling round. Above, on tallest trees remote, green ayahs perched alone, and all night long the musak moaned its melancholy tone. And where the purple nullahs threw their branches far and wide, and silvery gory wallahs flew in silence side by side, the little bishti's twittering cry rose on the flagrant air, and off the angry jampan howled deep in his hateful lair. She sat upon her doby, she heard the nimic hum, when all at once a cry arose, The cummerbund is come! In vain she fled, with open jaws the angry monster followed, and so, before assistance came, that fair lady was swallowed. They sought in vain for even a bone respectfully to bury. They said hers was a dreadful fate, and Echo answered, Very, 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 very. They nailed her doby to the wall where last her form was seen, and underneath they wrote these words in yellow, blue, and green. Beware, ye fair, ye fair, beware nor sit out late at night, lest horrid cummerbunds should come and swallow you outright. End of the Cummerbund Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Roloffs the Akund of Swat. Who, or why, or which, or what, 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 is the Akund of Swat? Is he tall, or short, or dark, or fair? Does he sit on a stool, or a sofa, or a chair, or squat, squat the Akund of Swat? Is he wise, or foolish, young, or old? Does he drink his soup, and his coffee cold, or... Ha, 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 the Akund of Swat. Does he sing or whistle, jabber or talk, and when riding abroad, does he gallop or walk or trot, trot, trot. the Akund of Swat? Does he wear a turban, a fez, or a hat? Does he sleep on a mattress, a bed, or a mat, or a cock, ha, ha, ha. the Akund of Swat? When he writes a copy in round-hand size, does he cross his T's and finish his I's with a dot, 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 the Akund of Swat? Can he write a letter concisely clear without a speck or a smudge or smear or blot, blot, blot. the Akund of Swat? Do his people like him extremely well? Or do they, whenever they can, rebel or 
plot, plot, plot at the Akond of Swat. If he catches them then, either old or young, does he have them chopped in pieces or hung, or shot, shot, shot. the Akond of Swat? Do his people prig in the lanes or park, or even at times when days are dark, garrot, oh, the Akond of Swat? Does he study the wants of his own dominion, or doesn't he care for public opinion a jot, 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 jot. the Akond of Swat? To amuse his mind, do his people show him pictures, or anyone's last new poem, or, or what, 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 for the Akond of Swat? At night, if he suddenly screams and wakes, do they bring him only a few small cakes, or a, a lot, 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 for the Akond of Swat? Does he live on turnips, tea, or tripe? Does he like his shawl to be marked with a stripe? Or a dot, 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 the Akond of Swat? Does he like to lie on his back in a boat, like the lady who lived in that isle remote? Shall 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 the Akond of Swat? Is he quiet or always making a fuss? Is his steward a Swiss or a Swede or a Russ or a Scot? Dot, 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 the Akond of Swat. Does he like to sit by the calm blue wave, or to sleep and snore in a dark green cave, or a grot, grot. the Akond of Swat? Does he drink small beer from a silver jug, or a bowl, or a glass, or a mug, or a cup, or a pot, pot. the Akond of Swat? Does he beat his wife with a gold-topped pipe, when she lets the gooseberries grow too ripe? Or rot, 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 the Akond of Swat? Does he wear a white tie when he dines with friends, and tie it neat in a bow with ends, or a, a knot, 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 the Akond of Swat? Does he like new cream and hate mince pies? When he looks at the sun, does he wink his eyes, or not, knot, 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 the Akond of Swat? Does he teach his subjects to roast and bake, does he sail about on an inland lake in a yacht, yacht, yacht. the Akond of Swat? Someone or nobody knows I what, who or which or why or what, 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 what. is the Akond of Swat. End of Laughable Lyrics by Edward Lear